on RTMS in 2003. And if you think about it, the main focus areas on a higher level is safety and sustainability of the environment, the infrastructure, as well as the sustainability of fleet operators. So it's, it's all about managing risk. Um, a lot of operators may be not aware of the importance of managing risk. But should, certainly, as you'll hear from, an, a, finance, from a finance uh, uh, person and from the insurance point of view, managing risk is extremely important. It's also about promoting compliance and increasing productivity. So if we want a high standard, uh, a, 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 a good uh, transport efficiency in any country, uh, you need a high standard of uh, efficiency and safety in terms of road transport. And South Africa has got a particular challenge in that, that we've got long distances between major in industrial areas, Gauteng, and the ports. So we, we, we actually at a disadvantage compared to many other countries in the world. And we don't have big navigable rivers, because that's the cheapest way of transporting bulk freight is on rivers or on ships. So most of our transport is either on rail or road. And as we've seen in the last 20 years, the rail uh, capacity has dropped significantly. So about 80% or more of freight is on, on rail. So we, we need a high standard of infrastructure in terms of our road network, and that, in fact, is, is the case. I won't go into a lot of detail, but South Africa has actually got a very high standard of the primary road network, and even our secondary road network is of a very high standard based on international norms. We also want minimum incidents and crashes, including breakdowns. As soon as you have crashes and breakdowns on the network, you downgrade the capacity. Lanes are blocked, and especially in, in uh, metropolitan areas like Gauteng, um, you can have a fantastic network, but if you've got frequent crashes and breakdowns, you actually downgrade the capacity significantly. And this is where we come far short of international norms. So although our infrastructure is very good, when we start looking at operations on the network, we, we come very short. Compliance with traffic regulations. I don't think I have to say anything there. It's, it's a big, big problem. Um, safety and security. We, we need to have safety and security on our network that people can travel safely. And this is particularly important for tourism. South Africa's big attraction for tourists is not just to come to Johannesburg, but it's to travel in the country, to see the beautiful parts of the country, go to the game reserves. So you need, you need good roads and you need safety and security if we're going to promote tourism, which can be potentially a huge income for the country. Efficient emergency response, seamless cross-border transit. So with point number one, as I said, we, we do well, but the rest of them, we, we've got major, major challenges. Um, this is a, just a little clip. So I'm on one of these WhatsApp groups, InvestorPol, which reports mainly on uh, activity in KwaZulu-Natal. And, you know, it's, it's basically a daily occurrence that we have um, crashes, but crashes involving trucks. Um, and sometimes they're really quite significant. And this is particularly a bad, good, well, a good example. Um, And, I mean, it's, it's the frequency of, of truck crashes in South Africa is a lot higher than most, a lot of the other uh, countries around the world. I'll show you a graph just now. Um, reality check uh, in terms of our road network. We're very fortunate that Sanral, despite their problem with the, with the e-tolls in Gauteng, are maintaining an excellent primary road network. Our national road network is in a very good condition, but we do have roads, when you start going down to some of the provincial roads and municipal roads that get into a very bad, have, have, have de, uh, 
uh, regressed into really bad uh, conditions. Now, um, Kathy said, I'm, you know, I must, she sent me a video. I couldn't, it doesn't want to work in my um, PowerPoint. It's, some codec files are missing, but anyway, she said, I must show you. This is sort of, you know, we don't want to go there. I think, Mr. Msweni, is this in Pumalanga? Okay, that, that's thanks to Kathy. She sent it to me the other day. Um, I have to download some codec files to get it to run in PowerPoint. But if you look here, this was some research done on the impact of, road, of the road network on cost of road transport. And the, this was a, a number of trucks operating on various roads, which are classified as either being good, fair, or bad, and they, me they measured actual repair and maintenance costs. And you can see how it goes from about one rand a kilometer to two, over two rand. So that's a huge increase in cost. So maintaining a good road network is very, very important for um, efficient road transport, road freight transport. We have a lot of challenges in terms of vehicles on our network. Um, I don't know why this is, it should disappear. Um, I've been involved in the, uh, an initiative called the Break and Tire Watch, which is a two-day training event for um, traffic officers. And up to now, there have been 41 of these from two, 2006. And the first day is a theoretical training. Normally, there's anything between 60 and 120 traffic officers. Um, the next one is at Donkerhook in Pretoria. The last one was... I think down in, at Durbanville in, in the Cape. And um, on the second day is a practical. So the traffic officers are divided into groups and they go, we, it's run at a testing, vehicle testing center where there's a pit, there's a roller brake tester and the trucks are checked out, uh, pull trucks off the road. Um, so up to now, 738 of the trucks have been inspected as part of these training courses. Um, can anyone guess, or people who don't, who are, who are not involved in this, but how, what percentage of those trucks have been discontinued from use? Any guesses? So it's about 69% 60, of these vehicles were, have been discontinued from use. Um, the main focus is brakes and tires. They don't worry about overloading, so the, the vehicles are not weighed, but they, they check for other defects, expired licenses, etc. It's quite scary. Um, these are some examples where you get on an axle um, brakes on the one side, but no brakes on the other side. It's very, very common. Um, on the left is the brake lining touching the drum, which is what it should look like. And on the right are examples where you've got 10, 15 millimeter gaps, which means there's no braking taking place there. The adjustment's completely out. Sometimes the lining's gone completely. Even the, sh the shoe inside has been taken out. Um, here's a, an axle, and you can see the brake booster's been removed. So that tire on the, that wheel on the right has got no brakes at all. And this is far, far too common. Um, Joburg have introduced a new brake testing uh, method, so you just, I don't know, now it doesn't want to run. What's it? <laughs> so, just, just make sure your, your brakes are kept up to standard. Wheel nuts, often wheel nuts missing. Uh, the one that I was at at, at uh, Midway a couple of years ago, the, the traffic officer was able to remove those two wheel nuts with his fingers. So that's how tight they were. Um, tires often in a very bad state. And a lot of crashes are caused by tires bursting. You saw those two video clip, clips I showed you, both uh, caused by tire bursts. Um, sometimes the load securement is not 
appropriate. And there's, we, we all seen plenty of photographs of crashes. It's, it's, it's about safety and uh, fatalities and serious injuries. In this case, on the N1, Rigel Avenue, Pretoria, it was on the Thursday before the Easter weekend. So there was a truck and there were 11 um, <coughs> excuse me, light motor vehicles involved. And the northbound car carriageway was closed for about 13 hours. So all the Easter traffic that was heading north that Thursday afternoon, that Thursday, had to be diverted through the city, which caused huge delays and problems. So th th there's the whole impact of traffic flow. This is a, some data from an OECD study, and the, the line at the top is South Africa's statistic, heavy vehicle fatal crash rates per 100 million kilometers. And the rest are all OECD member countries, so admittedly they developed countries as opposed to a developing country, um, but you know they've got much, much lower crash rates, fatal crash rates. Uh, on this, this instance, on the N3, the queues were 30 kilometers long because of the lane closures. Um, yeah, you can see on the N3 in Peter Maritzburg, again, it's not something that happens very infrequently. It happens very frequently, causing delays, emissions of all these trucks. Um, the light motor vehicles are diverted onto the R103, but the trucks have to sit and wait. It's costing the country a lot of money. So these are sort of the challenges that we have. Um, I haven't spoken about all of them, but overloading is, uh, that's uncontrolled is destroying the network. Poor vehicle fitness and poor driver fitness. There will be a lot of uh, discussion about drivers today. Managing their fatigue, their health, and ensuring adequate training. Reckless driver behavior. Border post delays, bribery and corruption at waybridges and at, at roadblocks is called, and at traffic, traffic at vehicle testing centers. It undermines our efforts to improve productivity and safety. And so the results are poor road safety, high cost of transport logistics, um, deterioration of the infrastructure, and high levels of emissions. That's where we sit. Um, this, this table just goes into a little bit more detail of some of the primary negative effects and secondary negative effects of some of these areas of non-compliance. So I won't go into it in detail, but I mean, if you take um, inadequately trained drivers, the immediate impact is um, increased safety risk and fuel consumption. We've seen, I'm sure there'll be some case studies today which shows that as you, I think most of us know that if you improve driver training, it's not just about reducing the risk of, of crashes, but it's improving your productivity. Um, and then that has a secondary effect of increase in greenhouse gases. And so you can look at all these things. We also focus with the RTMS on things like underloading. So underloading increases your logistics costs and the number of trips. If you're consistently underloading in terms of, say, bulk commodities, um, where you're not, you're not monitoring the, d the density of the load. You're going to have more trips, so it, it results in increased fuel cons uh, consumption, congestion, and greenhouse gases. These are some of the impacts of these areas of um, either non-compliance or poor um, management. So you've already seen the board. I think most people are familiar with the board. They're now about... 17,000 trucks and buses that are part of the scheme, and it's really increasing at quite a significant rate. And there you can see, as my slide there still says 16,000, that's just literally a few months ago. Uh, Coca-Cola got their certification fairly recently, which added, what's it, about 600, 800, 800, 800. so there, there's, that's the reason for going from 16,000 to 17,000. Um, 200 and, it's now about 270 fleets. So it, it all started way back in 2002 where the CSR was, was in, uh, requested to do an overload control strategy for the Department of Transport National. 
And you can see that the outputs or the recommendations are all in those blue blocks. Most of it traditional stuff that one normally does. But we included a, a recommendation to look at self-regulation as a way of complementing law enforcement efforts. So th this was the original uh, aim of, of RTMS, which then was called the Load Accreditation Program. It was purely about trying to reduce overloading. And so we had an opportunity to start with this self-regulation project in the forestry industry. And Sapi and Mondi were two of the main consignor consignees that supported this project. So obviously it was in KwaZulu-Natal and in Pumalanga where it started. And we based the original standard on the, an Australian scheme called the National Heavy Vehicle Accreditation Scheme. But within the first year we realized that to just focus on overloading was far too narrow a scope. We realized that you know trucks that are just not overloaded but are poorly maintained and the drivers are not trained or they, the drivers are driving far too many hours a week, that you can't call that an accredited or a certified operator. So we expanded the rules to be a more holistic, um, and then we changed the name to road transport management systems. We approached the SABS to develop a standard. The recommended practice was published in 2007, and then the national standard in 2014. And Oliver's presentation will go into the details of the requirements. So if you want to become a certified operator, you basically have to demonstrate that you're covering a lot of all these areas that are listed on this slide. So it covers loading, safety, driver wellness, and general support. But Oliver will go into these um, areas in more detail. And as I said, the, the original focus was overloading, reducing overloading, but the biggest benefits that have come through from the case studies that we've had, and I think today is about probably the 57th workshop that we've had since 2008, so we've had a lot of workshops. Um, but the case studies that have come out from the operators have been the, the, the most significant improvements have been as a result of improved vehicle maintenance. <clears throat> I showed you those statistics from the brake and tire watch and drivers. So drivers has been, there's been a huge improvement with a lot of fleets as a result of um, implementing the RTMS and being, to having a systematic approach. Um, you guys late, you have to sit on this circle here. So health, health is a big area for potential improvement, um, which uh, you'll see in the case studies. We've had, we have support from the, the National Department of Transport and provinces in terms of promoting self-regulation because it makes their job a lot easier. Um, and you can see the fourth uh, pillar there is self-regulation and road safety. You know, when we first started on this journey, you know, people said, self-regulation with transport operators, come on, you must be joking. Uh, you know, that's a waste of time, especially from the, from the law enforcement perspective. They don't, you know, they don't trust a truck operator one bit. But think about it, we all, we all self-regulate. I, I use the example of brushing one's teeth. You know, most of us brush our teeth in the mornings. That's, that's self-regulation, unless your wife is like onto you and said, brush your teeth. But most of us, we, we brush our teeth because it's the right thing to do. Some of us pay our TV license because it's the right thing to do. So self-regulation is part of our lives. We all do it without even thinking about it. And same on the roads. Most of us, a lot of the time we self-regulate on the roads. Unfortunately, it's becoming less and less. So whether there are traffic officers around or speed cameras or not, we, we, we self-regulate by stopping. Um, so... But unfortunately, as I said earlier, the level of non-compliance on our roads in South Africa is, is horrendous. Oh, we're suddenly getting a, a little bit of a peak hour traffic. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> this was one of the workshops we had up in Polokwane. That's a Deputy Minister of Transport. Uh, handing out an RTMS certificate to one of the operators that, that was... Um, in Gululu bulk carriers. In fact, today we've got about, 
I think, seven, seven certificates to hand out. Uh, we'll do that just before we break for tea. This was a function down in, in Nelspruit, Bus Corps. They're one of the four bus operators that are certified. And there you have on the right the previous Minister of Transport and the MEC for Transport in Mpumalanga. Um, it was a, quite a nice function. And then this was down in, in um, Cape Town, Golden Arrow Bus Services. Gideon Neertling is, will be presenting today. I don't think he's here yet, but he should be here, hopefully. And this was there also the Minister of Transport, the MEC for Transport, Donald Grant, in the Western Cape is in the background there as well. So we've had some quite good functions and demonstration of support from government. I just want to end off with a couple of, uh, well, I could, you could call them case studies, but most of the program today is our case studies from the horse's mouth, horse's mouths. This is an example of the forestry, which was the original intention of the program. And you can see how the overloading in the forestry industry has come down significantly. Um, you, you can't read the figures, but the baseline in 2003 was over 30% of the trucks transporting timber to the pulp and paper mills in Mpumalanga and <coughs> KwaZulu-Natal were overloaded. One third, basically. And if you look at the last three years, from early 2015, the, the level of overloading has sort of hovered between 1 and 2%. And some months, like last month, it was down to 0.8%. And that's measuring between 20 and 30,000 trips a month. So all the data comes from the pulp mills where they weigh the trucks as they come in to deliver the timber, and we monitor that. We monitor which companies, which mills are accepting more overloads. In fact, most of the mills reject overloads. If a truck comes to the mill and it's overloaded, it gets rejected. So the forestry industry has taken a very firm stand in terms of eliminating overloading. And you can see the results there. I've, I've got a similar slide for the sugar industry. The last two years, overloading in the sugar industry has been less than 1%. They also started off in 2003 at about, I think it was 32% of all trucks carrying sugar cane to the mills were overloaded. So this is just an example from an overloading perspective how one can promote um, compliance. And the interesting thing is we don't have average payloads from the, the, sh the forestry industry, but in the sugar industry, the average payloads have actually increased. So by, imp by um, installing onboard load cells, one can it largely eliminate underloading. Because as you know, uh, as you would know, sugar cane, timber, even coal, the, the density can vary quite significantly. So it's not, you can't just say, we load to this level for every trip. You, have, you need to have an idea of what the density is of the load. So if, particularly in the sugar industry, they would typically underload a lot, which, as I said earlier, it's increased costs, increased numbers of trips. Um, City of Cape Town, electricity support services is, I think, still the only government fleet that's RTMS certified. They are a passionate uh, bunch of guys. Um, I, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but they're running about actually uh, 900 vehicles um, and when they started their fleet availability was 60, 65%, 69%, 65% and um, they've increased that to 92%. So these are just some of the monitoring effects from 20, 2005 to 2016. Um, their stock replacement cycle Functional alignment, having the right vehicle for the right job, from 40% up to 85%. Fleet availability, as I said, up to 92%. Service schedule attainment was 47%. So less than half their vehicles were being serviced according to the required, uh, at the required intervals, and they, at, they increased that to 98%. So their fuel consumption over eight years improved by <coughs> 24%, that's 900 odd vehicles, varying from big trucks to smaller LDVs. Um, so they're saving about 6 million a year. Savings on repairs and maintenance. Monitoring traffic violations, you can see, and this is what RTMS is all about, measuring and monitoring and then taking corrective action. 
So you've got to know what's happening out there with your vehicles and where there are problems, you need to do something about it. And that's really what it's all about. Um, reduction, showing a reduction in incidents. Uh, complying with the f uh, maintenance compliance, uh, yeah, proactive maintenance compliance. Um, I'm going to give a, a little case study of Dawn Logistics. The pretty lady there in the photo is here somewhere. Where's Danny? Yes, she's not with Dawn Logistics anymore. She's she's one of the sponsors for today. Oh, that reminds me. I must show the sponsors slide. I'll do that just now. Um, but she, she got, uh, this is about 2013, I think, the 13 depots of Dawn Logistics certified through the RTMS. Uh, and that, those photos are the, fun the function that we had when we handed out the certificates. But these are just some positive results. It comes from her uh, case study. Reduction in fines, you can see there. Reduction in crashes from 37 down to 20. Driver error cr crashes due to driver error. Big, big uh, improvement, and then breakdowns down to about one-third. These are significant improvements. This is a fleet of going up to about two, just over 250 vehicles, 257. You can see now the speeding events, that's measured using telematic system, 60,000 in 2014. That's an average of 300 per vehicle per year, speeding events. And, I mean, this is a an incredible improvement down to 4,900 in 2017. That, that represents reduction in risk. Because if your fleet of trucks are speeding on a very regular basis, the risk of crashes and incidents is, is much, much higher. Um, their fuel consumption, you can see there from 2013 to 2017, improved by 23%, and that's now kilometers per liter, increased by 23%, and it's mainly attributed to better maintenance processes and driver behavior. So eliminating speeding, harsh braking, um, aggressive acceleration, etc. ZZ2 are certified, and they had one year they had zero insurance claims. And uh, reduction in speeding events by vehicle delivery services. A lot of companies have measured reduction in crashes. And then, as I mentioned earlier, qualitative benefits, um, mainly associated with drivers. Difficult to measure, but driver attitude, driver motivation, reduction in driver absenteeism, these are all things that have come out in case studies as a result of paying more attention to drivers. So the idea of the RTMS is that from our earlier parts of the presentation, we've got a high level of non-compliance out there, whether it's speeding, overloading, vehicle fitness, driver fitness, etc. And law enforcement has a very small impact on trucks on the road. Uh, if you talk to law enforcement, they'll say it's probably less than 5% of the trips every day. Or, um, Adrian, did you switch it off? Um, so the, the idea of RTMS, okay, there we go, is to move that vertical line over to the right, get more operators to voluntarily be more compliant. There are significant benefits associated with that, and it just makes the whole the, the road network for all road users safer, and also um, re will reduce our logistics costs. That's a, a document. Uh, that's been produced by Fleetwatch magazine, which gives a lot more detail about, about the RTMS. So thank you.